going to use the chat function um, for questions. So if you want to throw your name into the chat function uh, and we keep the, the order running there. And again, if you have an issue with chat, just use the hands up and I'll see that as well. So uh, Daniel Pitcher is going to get us going. Uh, Jonathan, good morning again. And Daniel Pitcher uh, from FM 104 and Q102 is on the line. So good morning, Daniel. everyone. Good morning. Hi, Daniel. Hi. Good morning, Jonathan. How are you? Good to see you. Um, I suppose that <laughs> there, there, there's lots of things that, that, that we can talk about. Um, first of all, just in, in sort of reverse order to the announcement that was uh, made last night in relation to the, the streaming services for the League of Ireland, an awful lot of uh, fans will have been quite anxious at various reports suggesting that uh, you know it might not go ahead and stuff like that. But for, for the announcement that, that it was last night, that it was going to go ahead, that the Women's National League was also going to have a streaming platform um, extremely positive yeah look and uh, uh, thanks for the question Dan um, yes I think that was a, a, an important announcement for us to make and uh, uh, look we're also uh, we're, we're very thankful to our partners at RTE uh, not least because they are going to uh, be our main broadcast partner for our live games as well um, but for also uh, supporting us in relation to um, to the watch LOI service um, Look, I, I genuinely believe that this is uh, th this is something that we, as an association, uh, need need to do and needed to do last year as much as this year. But from a very simple perspective of it being a service for the fans, and that's what I see this for. So I'm really pleased that we're able to extend the service from last year uh, into the first division games, and as you say, also into the women's national league for the first time. And we are going to make those women national league games. Um, free of charge so anyone can uh, can access them which i think is um again a, 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 another positive step uh in our support of of women's football so yes uh, it was important uh, to get that message out it was important that the clubs understood um uh, how they can interact with the um uh, with the service if you like because um clearly in a scenario whereby um it looks as if we will be playing behind closed doors until uh, the end of the first phase so the first 14 rounds until the end of May um, uh, the, the clubs wanted to uh, to understand how they could um, market their own season tickets if you like uh, in the context of a COVID situation um, but with the support of a streaming service so um, yeah we were really pleased to get that, um, that that's announced. And in terms then for like the the I suppose the the second to you know the second half towards the end of the season looks sort of a little bit cloudier. Can you shed a little bit of light on on, on how that's going to work for them? No, look, look. first of all, we are hopeful that we will have some fans back into the stadia um, for the second part of the season. But um, clearly we can't anticipate that now at the moment. Um, but if we do, um, then um, the, the, the streaming service in theory becomes... Um, less necessary in terms of uh, the, the, the service to those fans who go to the games, but the service will still be there. So those fans that may not be able to, uh, to, to get to the matches will still be able to use it. Um, as I say, we've, uh, we, we, the FAI, have invested into um, a system um, with, uh, which is called Pixelot, where the cameras um, will allow not just to have all of those games um, covered, but also um, it, it does give a, a very useful um, service to our um, to, 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 to the coaching teams at the clubs, actually, in relation to um, player analysis. So um, those cameras aren't going anywhere. There will be um, a streaming service um, for the second half of the season. Um, it's just that we hope that it'll be in the context of fans being able to get back and watch their teams play, which uh, I guess everybody is hoping for. And I suppose then lastly, for me, then, um, an awful lot of discussion this week about the makeup of the first division, lots of varying reports as to, you know, how that was going to work. Um, licenses given to, to various teams, Dublin County um, in, in particular, who um, I'm sure you'd, you'd understand that there was an awful lot of disappointment um, about what happened with them, given that they claimed to have had assurances that they were going to be in the division. They claimed to have assurances that they were going to be able to use Morton Stadium. What happened there? Well, look, first of all, the licensing process um, is an incredibly important process, um, um, which UEFA demand of all um, football associations, actually. And um, that gives us the confidence um, that all of our clubs are, um, uh, are in a position to be able to, um, to fulfil their fixtures. Um, clearly, all of that has been complicated this year by, um, by COVID. So we didn't finish last season until the back end of December. And that put a real, a real pressure on the process. Uh, we also have pretty uniquely um, uh, this, uh, 
this approach to expression of interest um, for, for any club really to become part of the first division. Um, and it wasn't just Dublin County who um, expressed an interest accordingly. I think there were nine teams um, uh, overall who did. Uh, and we went through that process and um, uh, part of the overall process was uh, uh, to, to, to gain a license to be able to um, be uh, reviewed by both the NLEC and the FAI board in relation to whether or not they could become part of the um, uh, uh, of the first division. Once we knew who had got those licenses, um, the board um, discussed uh, the options um, uh, uh, available and open to it um, and took its decision accordingly. And um, uh, we knew that uh, once the NLEC had decided um, that it wanted to support a 10 club league, um, that there were going to be some clubs who were disappointed. And um, yeah, but I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm satisfied and confident that the, um, uh, the, the debate that the board had was, um, was, was, was well informed and was balanced. And, uh, and it took the decision it did in relation to treaty and uh, well done to treaty um, for being part of, uh, uh, of, the league, of the first division moving forward. Thank you, John. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Gavin Cooney from the 42. Gavin, good morning. Morning. I'm coming through there okay, am I? Yeah, we can see you, Gavin. Okay. Nice you. to see you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Good to talk to you. Uh, can I just double check, first of all, are you still working from your home in London? or have you? Moved I, am, I am still working from my home in London. Um, I am very hopeful that I will get to Dublin um, for, the, um, for the World Cup qualification matches um, in March. Uh, and also hopefully for the start of the, um, uh, the, the League of Ireland matches. And I'm talking, uh, we are talking to both sets of government um, uh, in relation to that. Um, obviously, no one has been in, um, in our offices in Abbottstown at all since last March. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, on balance, the board were comfortable that um, via the gift of Teams and Zoom, um, I've been able to, um, to fulfil all of my... Um, all of my necessary duties. Uh, it's not how I'd like it to be. Uh, the way I do business um, uh, uh, has been face to face. And, and I think everybody craves that um, in, in a COVID environment, if you like, but we've made the best of the situation that we have in front of us as many businesses have had to do across many different sectors, not just in Ireland, but across the world. So, um, but I'm, I, I, I've been working uh, good long hours and have, um, been listening to lots of different voices from across the uh, the Irish community, if you like. Yeah, I was wondering, as part of your preparation for the new job, Jonathan, whether you read Champagne Football, the book about the misadventures of your. Yeah, self. look, I've 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 read excerpts um, of it via um, uh, the Sunday Times serialization of it. Um, look, it would be foolish for me to say that um, I. Uh, it, it's not important for me to understand the past to be able to. To frame our here and now, um, but very much our future as well. So um, uh, that there's that there's any number of uh, of legacy issues, some of them in 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 the book and some of them not, um, that I have had to listen to and to deal with moving forward. That's part of the job. That's part of the role. Um, but I am focused on the future because what else can I do um, mm. other than be focused on the future? And I think um, the staff um, of the FAI. Uh, the board of the FEI and all of our stakeholders um, want to want to to hear and see both my vision and the organisation organisation's vision for a for a modern, progressive, and di diverse um, sports governing body moving forward. And uh, yeah. that's what I'm concentrating on. So it's the it's the future rather than the past. Yeah, I I think if you are introducing yourself to Irish football fans, which I suppose is the purpose of this call, the one question that I think everyone will have is. How are you different to John Delaney? Uh, well, I don't, I, I, I don't know John, so to, to that degree, I can't answer that question in terms of a comparator. I know what I am. Based, and, based, uh, off, based off how you know he did the job previously. Well, look, I, look, I tell you what I am, and, uh, and, uh, and I am hopefully a reasonably straightforward, um, straight-talking uh, Yorkshireman. Um, I, I like to think that I have an open and, uh, uh, and, and collegiate approach to doing business. Uh, I'm not afraid to take decisions um, I think I have a good, solid understanding of the world of football. I've been in it for 25 years. Um, uh, Ten of those years I spent at the Football Association in England. Um, so nothing that I'm seeing now in relation to um, the perennial debates that happen within um, any uh, football society or any football association are new to me. Um, uh, I've been lucky enough to work with um, 
some really talented um, people who are now very senior within their um, with, within their various organisations um, uh, across the world of football, which to a degree is by dint of being still standing 25 years on. Um, but hopefully I've learned from all of those experiences. Hopefully I can tap into those um, to those senior contacts now, not just at UEFA and FIFA, but across the whole world of football and indeed the whole world of sport, because um, whilst an understanding of football is really important, I think you need to understand what's happening in the world around us. And um, unless we uh, unless we understand that, we can't uh, remain as um, as as a relevant um, um, sport um, amongst everything else that's happening in in young people's lives at the moment. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that, that's what I think I am, and uh, how that compares, I'll let you guys decide. Okay, perfect. And then I've just two very quick questions as regards the present and the future. What's happening with Robbie Keane? Because as it stands, he's making a lot of money doing nothing effectively. Yeah, yeah. R- R- Robbie Robbie remains um, uh, an FAI employee. I haven't, um, being t- totally honest, had uh, the opportunity yet to sit down and to talk with him. Um, I will do that. Uh, as I have done with uh, with many people, look, uh, R- Robbie clearly is a is a legend within um, it, within Irish football, and um, I look forward to having um, uh, again a, a, an open and uh, a, an honest conversation with him about the situation. Okay, so around at the AGM last December, there was talk that you know you would discuss a potential new role for Robbie within the FAI, but is that still the agenda? And obviously it hasn't happened yet. I, I, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and I'm very mindful of that. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I, I am open um, to, 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 to all different possibilities in relation to Robbie. But Robbie will tell me where he, where he is currently, I hope, when we get the chance to, um, uh, to chat. Okay. And lastly, for me, uh, and I appreciate you answering all these questions. So thanks very much. But have we got a sponsor for the Republic of Ireland senior men's team in time for March? Or where are we? Uh, if, if, if I had a sponsor um, for the teams, I would uh, certainly have told you by now, that's for sure. Um, look, uh, I inherited a situation whereby um, three who are our, um, our national team sponsor right up to the end of um, 2020 and had been for 10 years, and we thank them for their support. Um, but I, uh, I inherited that situation. Look, I've been involved in the um, commercial side of sport for a long time, as I say. Uh, normally speaking, a deal of that magnitude and that complexity would take somewhere between um, six to 12 months door to door, if you like, um, to be consummated. So um, to, to, to find a national team sponsor in a COVID scenario, in a Brexit scenario where brands and businesses are under extreme pressure for very understandable reasons, uh, was always going to be a challenge. But does that mean we're not out in the marketplace talking confidently about um, the platforms that we think that we can deliver to a national team um, sponsor? And I completely and 100% believe in that platform because we are the number one sport in the world. And uh, this year of all years, a World Cup qualification year, uh, is one that reminds us as to um, uh, how how unifying... um, Irish football can be, if you like. So um, uh, we're out there, we're talking, and um, uh, if, if, if something happens, and it's certainly our intention to find a partner, um, we will let you know. Jonathan, thanks very much. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, Rob Harton and now from Sport for Business, please. Rob, good morning to you. Uh, morning, Cahill. Morning, Jonathan. Um, Gavin has asked my question. Hi, Rob. I guess you're uh, <laughs> not consummated, but going out with a couple of people, perhaps. Um, yep. The the Pixelos coverage on the yep. um, First Division and the Women's National League, will there be any commentary or any additional production on that? Or is that an option for clubs to bring on board like some of the, uh, the other sports might have done towards the end of last year? Yeah, I think at First Division level and um, Women's National League level, that is the type of creative uh, discussion we're going to have with the individual clubs. And we know that... Um, there are people across all of those clubs uh, and maybe local um, uh, radio stations who could provide commentary, et cetera, in relation to, to those games. The most important thing, w- I think, was to get the, um, the feed sorted and, and actually the, um, uh, the pictures that you get from the Pixlot system are remarkably good. Um, and so I'm really I, I'm genuinely pleased that we are able to say that we will be broadcasting all of those, uh, those, uh, those League of Ireland and uh, Women's National League games. Um, but we will uh, we'll be talking with the clubs uh, clearly only last night uh, that we um, 
that we finally presented to them as to what the um, approach was going to be. But we'll talk with them to uh, to talk about those uh, additional production issues, if you like. Okay. Um, a quick one. Larry Bass uh, stepped down last week as chair of Cabin Tealy and presumably from the finance committee as well, which he had some issues with previously. Is there... Has the Finance Committee been fully constituted yet, or has it met recently? Um, the Finance Committee um, is, is, is going to be part of the, um, uh, the, the Audit Committee, uh, which we felt was the, um, uh, the, the appropriate route forward. Clearly, the Board um, has complete oversight of all of the financial um, uh, dealings of the Association, so we feel that we have that, um, uh, we have that properly covered and we have... Uh, uh, in particular, the uh, the right skill sets from our uh, for our new independent directors um, to help and support uh, our overall um, desire and need to see financial um, change uh, and financial processes, if you like. So that's the approach there. And Larry was um, was completely aware of that. I had um, uh, a very long conversation um, uh, with Larry in relation to that, so he was fully aware of it. And um, by the way, I think. Um, it's uh, Larry moving on is a real loss to um, to Irish football because I think um, what he did with Cabin Tealy was um, was exceptional um, from uh, both from the grassroots level all the way through to, um, uh, to 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 the league side if you like. But um, we have agreed to keep in touch. Um, Larry is, uh, has a, a great knowledge of the uh, of the media um, sector and of the media landscape, and uh, I'll be using his counsel moving forward as well in relation to. Um, our future approach to um, to our engagement with the broadcast sector, if you like. Okay, uh, last one from me, just on the on the sponsorship side again. You've got a, an existing sort of portfolio of good, strong sponsors, yep. and Boots, Aviva. Have you had a chance to meet with, in a virtual sense or a real world sense, with any of those sponsors at the moment, and are they all fully committed and on board? Sure. Well, I reached out to all of them when uh, when I was announced back in November. Uh, we actually have um, a meeting next week of all of the sponsors and partners, and uh, where we'll speak to them in the round. And um, yes, I think uh, uh, we we uh, we have all of their support. We have a, a a couple more announcements to make in relation to renewals of deals, which I'm very happy about. Uh, clearly, I was very happy that we um uh, we had the announcements that we had with SSE Electricity, uh, and in particular on the basis that they had been contemplating moving out of the out of Irish football, if you like. But um, after discussions with them, um, we persuaded them to come back in, but not just to come back in um, in relation to the men's leagues, um, but also to support the, um, the the women's national league, which we think was um, which was a, a hugely important moment. And at the same time, um, the Bank of Ireland have come in as a partner um, uh, for, for all three of the leagues at associate level. Again, exactly the type of brand uh, that we want to have associated um, uh, with Irish football and with the Irish leagues, and um, uh, it's exactly um, it's exactly that type of uh, portfolio of brands that we want to attract to Irish football. And uh, I know that we have um, uh, some work to do in relation to the overall um, perception and positioning of uh, uh, of the association um, to. Um, to, 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 to allow ourselves the possibility of brands like SSE and uh, uh, the Bank of Ireland and um, brands like Aviva and Boots, as you say, and others, um, to want to um, proactively be part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the story of Irish football moving forward. But um, I'm confident that we will get to that point. Great, thanks. And uh, good luck as you move beyond your 100 days then. Thank you, Rob. That's very kind of you. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, Declan Hughes is next from Dublin City FM and then Ed Lee, and then I'm going to go to Owen Kelsra after that. So just keep an eye on the chat for the running order. Declan Hughes, good morning to you. Good morning, Carl. Good morning, Jonathan. Jonathan, Hi, um, the COVID situation is going to affect the product that the FAI have, which is the international season ticket. And when the fans are allowed back, chances are we won't be able to have a full stadium. It'll be a partial stadium. Will there be a kind of a restructuring done on that international season ticket package for qualification matches and friendlies? Uh, the simple answer to that, Declan, is yes. And um, uh, look, along with uh, with other sports, and uh, this is also a challenge um, that UEFA are facing in relation to Euro 2020, where obviously they have sold, pre-sold um, uh, uh, tickets uh, on the original assumption that they would have 100% capacity at all of the grounds. Um, and... Uh, Clearly, nothing would give me a greater pleasure than to see a full Aviva Stadium 
uh, when we beat Portugal um, to qualify for the World Cup. Um, but we have to be realistic of where, uh, whereabouts we are uh, in relation to the pandemic and in the management of the pandemic. And um, we're already looking closely at um, a phased return of fans uh, to, to games, which we think is the sensible and prudent approach. And um, yeah, as I say, as with other um, uh, other sports and, and, and other football clubs and associations, uh, we will have to have um, a fair and uh, well communicated approach uh, to how we deal with that when we have a restricted number of fans allowed into the um, into the stadium. But to be honest, Declan, I think um, all of us will be happy if we get to the point where we even have 5,000 fans in the stadium or 10,000 fans, because actually one thing that I have noted in those markets where fans have been allowed in, even when it's um, just a very small number, two, three, four thousand, boy, do they make a hell of a lot of noise. And um, if uh, if we have the chance to have five, nine, ten thousand Irish fans in the Aviva Stadium, I suspect after uh, a long period of time without having the joy of being able to watch the team, they will make a lot of noise and particularly in a World Cup qualification process. So, um, look, we want to get as many of our fans into the ground as we can do. Um, Broadly speaking, I, all, I, I always want to see um, full stadia for all of our games, um, but clearly we will, um, uh, we will be guided by, um, by the health authorities as to what we can do and the parameters around what we can do moving forward. My next question is about the League of Ireland. Um, we've recently seen uh, difficulties with the formation of the first division. Now, one of the issues was the fact that last season, uh, a second team from one of the Premier Division clubs was allowed to be a member of a first division club. Now, that was an answer to the issue that there's a huge gap between under 19 level and senior level. Some years ago, we had a thing called the A-League, Jonathan, which was a bit like the Spanish third division. It was a mixture of reserve teams and clubs that wanted to join the first division proper. Is there any plans to bring back something similar to the A-League? Because quite clearly, the gap between under-19 and senior is unbridgeable for some players without some kind of intermediate system. And it would also be a way of uh, teams trying their hand at being members of the League of Ireland. Look, I think, I th- I think, I think the question is very well phrased. Um, I, 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 look, I come from um, uh, an English football background and being part of the, uh, uh, the English FA. Uh, and clearly, there is a very uh, clear pyramidical structure uh, to English football uh, that I think that we um, we in Irish football could um, could could take learnings from and um, in all of my conversations with uh, the, the, the the chairs and CEOs of the, of the clubs up till now I've said um, uh, look I'm ruling nothing in and nothing out in relation to the future structure of the leagues moving forward um, I do think that the um, uh, a, a system and a process whereby any club can come along and be uh, be considered in a formal process to be part of a first division um, brings uh, 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 certain challenges with it. And as you, you alluded to them, we had those challenges in the process this time. So um, I am very open to looking at um, uh, uh, differing structures that could address some of the issues that you ask in your question. So the answer, the simple answer to your question is yes, that I am open to those uh, discussions and uh, I've already spoken to, um, to to the FAI board in relation to that, and we will do a full review of that expression of interest process in relation to first division, and then, as you say, widen it out um, into um, a broader discussion about um, the overall pathways, if you like, for younger players through to um, through to uh, League of Ireland status, because that's what we all want to see: um, is is young Irish players playing in a strong and vibrant League of Ireland. And one final question on the Women's National League. Uh, We've seen um, the introduction this coming season of an under-19 division, and that's welcome because, again, with women's football, the gap between under-17 and senior was bridgeable for an elite group of players, but the vast majority needed some kind of intermediary step to take them from playing with 17-year-olds to playing against adults. Um, With that in mind, uh, we've seen cross across the channel with, with the FA, uh, that the success of the national team sometimes can lead to a boost to the domestic game. I, I'd take it back to the 2015 Women's World Cup, where the success of England's national team saw a 300% increase in the second half of the season vis-a-vis the first half of the season, because the World Cup kind of happened in the middle of the season. We've failed success. We failed spectacularly in this country to build on the success of senior teams in international soccer to bring it back to domestic uh, 
in terms of boosting successes because there's a tendency in this country to be a nation of event junkies. I think anybody you've spoken to would probably uh, have, have shared that with you. How can, we, how can we do what the FA did successfully with regards to transposing success in women's international football into the domestic league and vice versa if the men yep. qualify for the World Cup uh, bring, again, an increase across to the domestic game? Thank you for the question, Declan. Um, yeah, look, the, the, the first uh, and obvious um, answer to that is uh, that we have a women's team that does qualify for those major tournaments. And so I was, um, you know, I was really pleased this week to be able to announce um, that Vera Powell um, uh, has agreed to stay on as the um, as the coach of the women's national team, which I think is an incredibly important moment because um, not only is she uh, a, an excellent football coach, and we've seen that in relation to the transformation that she's um, she's had on the team, and they were so so unlucky uh, not to qualify for the Euros actually, um, but she's also an inspiration um, in of herself. Um, for women and girls who are looking at playing football. And um, actually, she's an inspiration for the whole of Irish football, both male and female. So I completely agree with you that um, if and uh, we will give her a, a, every possible support in relation to um, her uh, planning and success in relation to the Women's World Cup 2023 qualification process, clearly, if she is um, successful, and it's a really tough, it's a really tough ask because we know that... Um, uh, the number of teams who qualify from uh, from the UEFA Confederation for for our World Cups is a, is a reasonably small number, but if she does, I absolutely agree with you. I think it would be transformational uh, for women's and girls football um, uh, in Ireland. And look, personally, I'm not against uh, the concept of uh, big events being um, being a catalyst for that type of excitement. And uh, as you say, I saw it at first hand. I have two daughters, um, fifteen, age fifteen and fourteen, both of them. Um, who play in my local club. I'm a coach at that club. When I joined, I think it was six years ago, they had 32 girls playing. They now have 362 girls playing. It's a simple equation. And um, so, um, look, I, I, and I, I, but I want to see um, continued success and continued support of, uh, of the women's game, not just um, in relation to 2023. So we have a whole two years before we get there and we'll continue to do some of the good things that I've mentioned earlier in relation to having um, all of the um, National League games live for um, for young girls um, to, to to watch and to see their to, to see their idols playing, and um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the same in relation to um, to a to a to a men's World Cup qualification process as well. And uh, uh, I said uh, I, I said earlier that I think that um, nothing galvanises the Irish nation, and I mean nothing. No other sport in Ireland galvanises the Irish nation. Um, and or a competition other than the, the, the FIFA World Cup does. And we have a really unique year this year in that we could have qualification uh, in one calendar year. So it's very condensed. It's never happened before. So it's going to be a very intense ride um, for Stephen and the team. Um, but I really hope um, that the Irish public get behind Stephen and I know they will do. And I know that um, everyone, as I say, wants to um, wants a good news story um, as we come out of... Um, a really difficult phase for Irish society uh, in relation to everything that's happened in terms of COVID. So, um, yeah, uh, let's 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 all cross our fingers for success. And by the way, not just at the senior team, but also at the um, at the underage team levels as well. We've got some really um, fantastic and talented um, boys and girls, as you mentioned, all the way down to under fifteen level, and some very committed coaches to um, to, to 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 supporting their development and. Uh, uh, we've already seen some um, some great results, and I saw the under fifteen team when they were allowed to play beat the England under fifteen team four 0 which um, uh, is 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 really excellent to see. So um, I want to see that across um, across all of our um, uh, progress towards tournament qualification. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Declan. Ed Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Declan. And uh, Ed Lee, he's next, and then Owen Kowser, uh, and then there's a, a free house if somebody wants to put their name into the chat function. So Ed Lee, good morning to you. Jonathan, how are you doing? Um, first Good, of all, you, uh, welcome you to the job. I hope it all goes well for you. Thank um, you very I much indeed. First of all, I'd like to get an update on, I suppose, your relationship with Stephen Kenny, his current position, whether he's 100% happy with everything that's happened over the last while and whether everything that has happened has been resolved and, and we're going to move forward with no problems. 
Yeah, look, as, as Stephen and I um, uh, talk on a regular basis, um, we actually met recently um, when he was in England um, uh, watching some matches. So we met in London. Um, we have a good, strong relationship. We talk about any number of issues. Uh, look, clearly Stephen had a very um, tough um, September, October, November um, in, in relation to a whole variety of things, be they um, injuries, COVID, suspension, family bereavement with players. Um, so, um, look, I think everyone uh, uh, within international football has um, has had to readapt to um, a, a, a new normal, if you like. And um, having players in a hotel bubble um, is very different from the past. Uh, and, and being asked, for example, to play three matches uh, in an international window is um, is extremely tough on the players. So, um, but I think Stephen and, and and his team and all of us within the organisation have learned from um, uh, that final quarter of 2020. And uh, all of our attention now is focused on uh, giving Stephen the best possible preparation um, for that World Cup qualification process. And um, and he has, broadly speaking, eight weeks until the first game. And uh, I know that he is already working extraordinarily hard in relation to being prepared for that. So can you give me an outline of how you were brought up to speed with the affairs at the FAI over the last 20 years or so? <laughs> over the last 20 years? Uh, look, um, uh, as I say, I've been involved in, um, in, in football for 25 years. So, um, uh, and uh, 10 of those years with the English FA. So, um, Clearly, I was aware of um, of, of, of the FAI and of, of the of the achievements of the uh, of the Irish national team. So, I had a good base knowledge of of the FAI um, from that experience. Um, look, uh, the the whole of my last three and a half four months has been an education in um, both the uh, both the history of uh, of Irish football uh, across all all levels of Irish football. But it's also been a, a learning process that will hopefully. Uh, inform how we address um, our current challenges, and clearly with COVID we have uh, we have many, but also how we um, how we approach um, um, the the future of Irish football. And uh, to be quite honest, I'm more interested in the next 20 years of Irish football than I am around about the last 20 years of Irish football. Although clearly I learn uh, as as everyone does uh, lessons from the past, but you hope that you take those lessons and you apply them in the in the most appropriate way. Um, for, de for, for developing the, uh, the modern and progressive and diverse fit for purpose organisation that generally I think everyone I've spoken to thus far wants to see in the FAI and in uh, across the whole of Irish football. Have you spoken to or intend to speak to um, some of the FAI's most vocal critics in efforts to build bridges with people whose experience could prove valuable in the future of football in, in, in this country? Yeah, I have spoken to, uh, as I say, a whole range of people and um, uh, 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 a whole range of people, be they critical of the FAI or not. And uh, look, um, I, I understand that um, football is a game of opinions and it's a game of very strong opinions. And um, as I say, having been in it for 25 years, um, I am not... Um, I am not afraid of having those open and transparent debates. And I've had a, any number of those conversations already. Um, and that is um, all a very useful part of my education um, in Irish football as I move forward. So, um, yes, um, I, uh, I'm open to speaking to, um, to, to anyone and everyone within the confines of being where, where, where we currently are in relation to COVID and uh, the, uh, the, the number of Zoom and team calls that I, can actually, that I can actually do. I have done a lot of listening. I think it's fair to say that Irish football has done a lot of talking to me as well. So I've, I've done more listening than I've done talking, but that's right and that's appropriate um, in this in this initial phase of my tenure, if you like. But um, uh, I, I'm not afraid to, um, to 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 draw my own conclusions in relation to key areas and to make um, at times difficult decisions moving forward. Have you have you spoken to James McLean to uh, discuss the anti-Irish abuse that he's uh, perennially suffers in, in England? I've, I've not spoken to James personally, but I'm, uh, clearly we're aware of the issues and um, uh, we've supported James uh, as an organisation, as an association and myself as well in relation to that via social media. Look, very simply, um, uh, and not personalising this, but no, no individual should be um, should, should, should have to face that type of um, abuse in social media or anywhere, actually, be it in, in, in a ground. And uh, 
we have a, a very firm view on that as an association and I know many other associations and UEFA and FIFA and I assume everyone on this call um, share that position. And have you raised these issues on the, because they're not just with James or with Irish players over the years. Uh, have you raised these issues with your English counterparts, uh, the, the, the governing body in England to, to you know, I, maybe, I, maybe I, take some action because from, from looking from this side of the water, there's very little action being done and James um, has, has suffered a, a serious amount of personal abuse and other players have admitted that they have as well. Yeah, look, this is, this is a complex issue. Uh, am I speaking with the English FA on a regular basis? Yes, I am, because um, both of us are involved in um, the, uh, the organisation of Euro 2020. We are talking about a joint bid in relation to World Cup 2030 as well. So we speak on a regular basis. Um, look, it's a complex issue. And uh, the, um, in fairness to the English FA, I think they are very committed to um, eradicating um, and any similar activity across across the board um, uh, in in England as well, but it, it needs the support of um, of governments of the social media companies as well, and um, I think they are um, uh, and I know that they're very um, proactive and uh, we have um, uh, people within our own uh, with, within the FAI itself. Des Tomlinson is uh, is it has overall responsibility, and I know that he is engaging on a daily basis. Um, not just with the English FA, but other FAs as well, and also with UEFA and FIFA. So um, we are we are very uh, we are very aware of the issue. And just my last question: I'm just wondering now, have you spoken to Damien Duff since his unexpected departure from the, na the national team? Because he, he said he he said he'd love to he will continue in Irish football. Um, and do you think someone with his international pedigree and his uh, respect within the game needs to be, uh, uh, I suppose, appeased and 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 Again, Bill Bridges will. Yeah, look, I, I, I have indeed spoken to um, Damien and we had a long, um, open uh, and honest discussion around a range of issues, to be honest. And um, um, that was very that was very instructive for me. Um, one thing I can say about Damien from that conversation, and, I'm, I, and I had met him before, but um, uh, he, he reminded me of his passion for Irish football and certainly for the Irish um national teams and he is completely um, supportive of Steve and his team and of the of the squad in relation to World Cup qualification and I don't think there'd be any um, Irish man or woman prouder than um, than Damien um, should we qualify for, for, for World Cup 2022 and um, do I want to harness that type of, uh, of passion and commitment um, to, uh, around Irish football moving forward, absolutely. So uh, we agreed um, that we would keep in touch and uh, we would keep we would keep on talking about those big issues. And um, I have no reason to disbelieve that um, Damien will not play um, uh, a major role um, around football moving forward. Full stop. Thank you. Thanks, Best of luck. Thanks, Ed. Uh, on Kowser's next. Just we're, we're under a little bit of time pressure shortly, so I'm going to keep it moving on. On Kowser and then. Uh, we will have Conor Hosford and then Martin Prendergast and then if there is time we'll get back to Gavin Cooney so Owen good morning to you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, hi Jonathan how are you doing? Hi Owen how are you doing? Um, just I'll keep the question brief um, would the FAI be willing to have a bookie as a sponsor again? Uh, no we would not and I think um, uh, we, we've made that um, reasonably clear um, in, in recent times um, uh, I was asked by the board to um, present a, a paper to it in relation to um, having um, betting partners um, within Ireland in relation to sponsorship partnerships. Uh, and they asked me to, to look at the pros and cons um, of so doing. Um, and as you know, that the, the, uh, betting partners are an integral part of, uh, of many parts of football. And you see that um, particularly in club football, certainly within English football in relation to, to front of shirt partnerships. Um, and and, and we, 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 we debated the issues openly. Um, and in the end, the, uh, the board, um, after that open debate, decided that it, um, it, it wasn't something that the association wanted to pursue moving forward. And, um, uh, and I was respectful of, uh, of that decision. And indeed, I supported that decision. So the simple answer to your question is no, we will not have a betting partner moving forward. Yeah, but would, I mean, I know Niall Quinn brought it up before your time, and I believe it's still part of the, the plan to um, pursue a part of the betting tax um, for, as a state bailout as such. Yeah, look, I think that's a, that, that, that's a wider and slightly different issue. Um, uh, and I think um, 
the, the chair of the FAI board, um, uh, Roy Barrett, is, um, is, is, is certainly passionate about that as, as an issue that he feels should just be debated more openly. And um, I think we will be part of that debate. I'd like to have that debate in the context of, um, of all sport, if you like, within Ireland and not uh, just have the focus on football. Um, and uh, if, uh, if, if, if the government is, is open to that engagement, then I'm sure that the debate will happen moving forward. Do you know how much that could possibly be worth to Irish football? Um, we have a good idea of what percentage of, uh, of, of betting um, uh, within Ireland is on uh, the sport of football. Um, but no, I wouldn't presuppose any, um, any discussions um, in relation to um, how that betting levy might be approached in the future. So that's for, um, that's for future discussions. But I think the, um, the principle is, um, is an interesting and a fair one to debate moving forward. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Owen. Thank you, Owen. Uh, Connor Hosford and then Martin Prendergast, and then we just try and squeeze one or two in after that, but we are running tight on time as we've uh, another call at 11. So, Connor Hosford, please. Hey, Jonathan. Um, Hi, Connor. Just, just a brief one for me. Uh, just asking, what's your, your experience in the uh, kind of grassroots game, both on a National League front and even as the national governing body, even going into the community side of things? Because obviously now with the pandemic, we're at a very kind of precarious situation in the grassroots game here. You have kind of the the, the, the split between elite and non-elite that was only introduced because of the pandemic in terms of training restrictions and stuff like that. Um, and you also have the, the extremely long layoffs uh, in terms of not being able to train or play matches. Um, previously, now I know it's all to do with different uh, different leagues and the, their own kind of uh, way of running things. But in the space, because of the pandemic and because of different things that happened before, some kids have lost out on nearly two or two or three years of, of playing time. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you think you're, you're going to work the grassroots game to kind of bring it back up to that strong level that we needed to be at in terms of, you know, developing the association as well as, you know, developing the, the players that come into the national leagues and maybe go across the channel in sure. the future? Yeah, uh, quite, quite a few elements to the question. Look, on a personal basis, um, I, I am fully and wholly committed to grassroots football because it's been my life, actually, um, uh, uh, on a personal uh, perspective in that um, I've been playing football ever since I was um, uh, since at the age of five and I'm still playing football at the age of 58 um, uh, in our super veterans team in the club that I created 33 years ago here in London. And um, uh, that's of ex Nottingham and uh, uh, Loughborough students. It's a club called Knottsborough. So I, I've lived and breathed uh, the challenges of, of, of grassroots football, if you like. I'm also um, a qualified coach and coach my um, 14 year old daughter and um, uh, 12 year, uh, my 11 year old son in his under 12 league. So what I am acutely aware of, um, because I know how much they are missing the simple pleasure of playing football, uh, is how much the um, uh, the grassroots of Irish football are also missing that simple pleasure of playing football. And um, yeah, you, you touched on a, a, a number of challenges. And um, look, I think um, at... Um, at the at the at, at, at the the national team level, for example, um, at under seventeen level and under fifteen level, some of our teams have not played competitively now for over fifteen months, and that's a real concern. Um, but we're clearly not alone. Uh, other federations and associations are, are facing the same challenges, and uh, the sooner we can get them back and playing competitive matches, the better. Uh, the sooner we can get back to uh, a return to play for all levels of, uh, of Irish football, the better as well. And um, I said before, uh, we follow um, uh, the guidance and the guidelines of, um, of, of, the, of the health authorities and of, of NEFET. Uh, we had a difficult period, if I'm being really honest, at the back end or at the start of December, um, when we went from lockdown five down to a lockdown three. And I think there was... Um, an expectation, certainly within the uh, within the association, and definitely within grassroots football, that that was going to be a precursor to um, a return to, um, to to not just training but also competitive football. But um, uh, Neffit had a, a a different view of what they felt was um, uh, was possible. Uh, and we re we reluctantly had to uh, to follow those guidelines, if you like. Um, but I know that the depth of feeling from the grassroots was exacerbated by the fact that what was deemed by Nefer to be elite football was allowed to carry on. And um, you know, my simple message now, as we um, as we continue to prepare ourselves absolutely for the next time we go from lockdown five 
to a lower level that we will be absolutely ready to um to, to return to play at all levels of irish football and um I don't discriminate between any of those levels. I want everyone to be playing football. Uh, and as I said, nothing would give me greater pleasure than, um, than our leagues, um, our, uh, our, our, our underage leagues and our clubs and our amateur clubs, both men and women, being allowed back onto a football pitch to do what they, um, to, to do what they love doing. And it's been an extraordinarily challenging period, uh, not just for the players, but also for, for our volunteers um, uh, who are continuing to keep um, um, grassroots clubs going through a very, very difficult um, um, scenario. And uh, we've, um, we've, we've addressed and debated and socialised all of those issues, if you like, at the highest level within government and certainly within the Department of Sport. And I know Minister Chambers is, um, is very sensitive to and conscious of, uh, of all of those issues. And it's not just about... Um, uh, physical health, if you like, it's also about um, mental health of, uh, of all of those people involved, not just in football, but in uh, but in all sports. Uh, the government has been extraordinarily supportive of sport and of football um, across 2020 with its um, with its resilience, um, COVID resilience fund and funding. Um, and we will uh, and we've already started the process of talking to them in relation to the effects of COVID across 2021. So. Um, and I'm, I, I, and I'm absolutely convinced that they will give um, the same support to sport and to football as they did in, in 2020. So, look, I think everyone um, is, is desperately keen to see football back um, for, 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 for many obvious reasons. And uh, the, the sooner we can do it, the better, but we have to do it in a safe and responsible way. And we've done that in relation to the organisation of uh, the League of Ireland, uh, and the return of the league, uh, the League of Ireland, and the Women's National League in March, are following, and we've improved our COVID protocols um, uh, accordingly. And even when we get back to playing and playing, playing and training at grassroots level, um, everyone will have to follow very uh, close um, COVID protocols uh, as we get back to a degree of normality. But um, I know that, and, and I th actually I thank everyone across the Irish football community to doing that so well. Um, in 2020, and I've no reason to disbelieve that they won't do the same in 2021. Hey, Hi, th thanks, Connor. Uh, this is going to have to be the last question from Martin Prendergast, just in, in reaction to a question there from Ed Lee. Yes, we will have audio uh, and video which we can send out to you, Ed. So if you drop us an email on that, uh, there's no embargo on this section at all. This section is absolutely live for digital broadcast, whoever wants it. So there's no embargo. Uh, from here on in, we will be uh, doing sessions with embargoes on them. Uh, so, Martin Prendergast, good afternoon. Uh, I think it is at this stage, probably to you, if not very close to it. <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much, Jonathan, uh, as well. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions. Hi, uh, sorry, hi there, Jonathan. Um, I just wanted to see, uh, you might have covered this, uh, have you spoken to Robbie Keane at all? And is he still involved with the FAI? And what, what's the situation with resolving anything with him? No, we, we, we have talked to it earlier. I haven't spoken to Robbie Keane as yet, but I am... Um, um, <laughs> committed to speaking to Robbie um, um, and I hope that he would um, welcome the opportunity uh, to have um, a, a, an open and honest discussion with myself. So um, uh, he remains an FAI employee, um, as I said earlier, um, totally respectful of everything that um, Robbie has done for Irish football in the past, past and uh, uh, I will have that um, hopefully constructive discussion with him moving forward. And um, sorry, the last question I have is, you, you mentioned hopefully having fans back at the Eva soon, which obviously we all want to see. Have you spoken to and had engagement with fans of supporters groups? And how do the FAI plan to engage with these supporters and generate excitement to get behind the team? Yeah, I, I, I've spoken to all uh, all three of the key supporters groups and I had 90 minutes with them, had a very um, a positive discussion. Um, as you know, they um, are already integrated into... Um, the fabric of, of, of the FAI organisationally, and they will be part of the um, of the new General Assembly moving forward. So um, that was a good discussion. Um, uh, clearly, there's going to be some um, some some complex um, discussions needed in relation to that phased return of fans, uh, particularly around the international team, when. Uh, almost certainly we'll have more people wanting to go into the stadium than we can allow to go into the stadium. So, yes, we will speak to them. Um, and look, I'm hugely mindful of the um, of the position and the stature and the reputation uh, of, of Irish fans, not just um, uh, Irish League of Ireland fans, if you like, but um, Irish international fans across the whole of the globe. And um, 
their reputation um, uh, goes ahead of them where, wherever they are. And, um, so I'm fully engaged with them and I hope that uh, we can see them uh, and, uh, and everyone back in a full Aviva Stadium, as I said earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you to everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, as I said, we will have audio and video available. Matthew will send that on as soon as the calls end and we can tran transport it out from Zoom or transfer it out from Zoom. Uh, so thank you for your time. Uh, for those of you who are coming on to the uh, 11 o'clock embargo session, I would ask you just to leave the meeting and come back in, please, if you wouldn't mind. We're just going to take a five-minute conversation.